Hi folks, Steve here, and let's talk through um, Patty Jenkins' Monster. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the title in a couple of minutes. Um, I just I, I think this poster, this uh, publicity poster, is quite interesting for a number of reasons. Um, although the star is very much Charlie's Theron, um, you've got Christina Ricci in um, the same font and font size as the star of the film, um, even though in the poster she's actually in the background. And I just um, I think that's a little bit interesting in the way that the film is sort of setting up um, uh, this to be a narrative about the two of them. So the two of them are almost equal stars of the film, which is what the poster is suggesting. And the film itself is very interested in um, in this sort of relationship between these two women, um, which, which is sort of used as a way um, to sort of humanise uh, the character of Eileen Warnos and um, normalise normalize the the character of Eileen Warnos. Now it does say under the under the the title monster. Uh, based on a true story. So this is, of course, another based on a true story uh, films. And it's interesting to think about, you know, what does it actually mean based on a true story? It's not saying this is a true story. It's saying it's based on a true story. So through the title, through the title, it's actually announcing itself as an adjustment adaptation. An adaptation an adaptation that's going to adjust particular facts and things about um, about the story um, to sort of suit the narrative and sort of and the you know the narrative that it's telling and for it to sort of sit, situate itself within um, the Hollywood entertainment narrative. Of course, Monster did very well at the box office and um, you know played at multiplexes and things like that. And Charlie's did wish receive an Academy Award for her portrayal, which, again, I'll talk about in a second. Um, the reason why um, Charlie is wearing a T-shirt with wolves on it is because she liked wolves, um, Alan Warnos, and she had always dreamed of raising wolves in her future life, which never, um, which never saw reality. Okay, so what I want us to think about with Monster is the central issue of adaptation and ethics and where, uh, where do the ethics actually sit for the filmmakers. We, we speak a lot about adaptation, about um, uh, fidelity and sticking true to the source and um, being faithful to the story. Where does ethics actually come in? Now, ethics has an important role in the based on a true story because we're not just talking about um, giving, say, the author of the source work their due. We're actually talking about real life people here and the telling of history. So, think about Monster. You know, is this fil is this film a a piece of entertainment or is it also a piece of education? Is it both? And can it actually be both? And the way that adaptation is part of this conversation is really interesting. Again, it's another multi-source adaptation. And the multi-source adaptation is a very complicated form of adaptation in that it doesn't rely on one source for its inspiration and its story and its characters. It's actually picking its pieces from a multiple range of sources and subjects, um, which in itself is kind of interesting. Now, the reason why I'm showing you um, Charlize all dressed up, holding her uh, golden statuette, is because it's kind of interesting the way that uh, during the publicity for the film, she was talking about uh, Warnos and her victims, and her and the victim's families and, you know, the problems of violence against women, uh, which the film is very much um, 
depicting violence against women and women acting out violence, violent rages. But when it came to the Academy Awards, she made no mention of this, right? When it came to the Academy Awards, she thanked the director, she thanked her co-star, and she kind of left it at that. And this did raise um, a number of people to really ask why on earth would she not be talking about the source of adaptation, the character of that she is actually adapting and impersonating. This film is very much about her impersonating someone. It's you know it's less a a, a masterclass in um, acting as it is in impersonation. Uh, Charlie's um, Theron, you know, watched the Nick Broomfield documentary, which is called Eileen, um, Life and Death of a Serial Killer. And she just mirrored how Warnos spoke, moved, acted, even things that she said, things that Warnos actually says in interviews in that documentary are actually um, not only regurgitated by Charlie Theron in this film, but the mannerisms, the tone, um, the, 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 the punctuation, the diction, everything is an impersonation, which again becomes really interesting for these sorts of films. Another film that comes to mind would be something like Chopper, you know, the Eric Banner film. Um, so when we're watching Monster, we're constantly reminded of the real um, uh, um, Eileen Warnos. Now, what do you think about... Um, about this, about the source, you know, where does the source be acknowledged? The film is tapping into broader social issues and should those have all also been raised? And is ethics something that, um, uh, you know, filmmakers should actually be considering and should they need to consider those things? Um, you know, unlike journalism, a filmmaker doesn't actually have a rule book of things they can ethically do and things they're not allowed to unethically do. Um, film is, of course, considered art. So just have a think about that when you're watching the film and sort of trying to frame it within an idea of adaptation. So analogy is, um, you know, the adaptation which is inspired by or based on. And what's interesting about Monster is it's an actual criminal case that raised potent questions about gendered violence. So when you're watching, think about this. Where does fidelity play in representing the social and political context of the subject? Right? What makes a based on faithful? Right? So where does fidelity play in representing the social and political context of the subject? And what I mean by that is how faithful does, say, Patty Jenkins have to be when she's representing this world that she's recreating? And does she have to be faithful to that world? And when we're talking about the based on, what is this film actually based on? And where's the fidelity to that? Because in a way, the film is based on pop popular um, media um, uh, representations of Eileen Warnos and the film is responding against those representations and actually giving sympathy to a character who very seldom is given any sympathy at all um, save Nick Broomfield's uh, documentary Eileen Life and Death of a Serial Killer. Now the film asked its viewers to consider the kind of world that produces an Eileen Warnos Right, so I think that's that's really interesting. So it's actually taking this character, it's fictionalizing the character, but then it's turning those questions back to society, to the viewer, and also making the viewer um, somewhat complicit in what's actually going on here. So uh, B.J. McCain, who's done the reading for this week, he says the adapter must create new context for making sense of the source. Right. Think about that, create new contents for making sense of the source, right? So what the film is doing, like I just said, is it gives a different context to think about Warnos, right? We don't walk out of this film, right, with the same view 
that popular mainstream media was giving us of Warnos. Yeah, so there's different media depictions of Warnos and violent women. And what's interesting about Warnos is she's not a typical serial killer. And the film is an atypical serial killer film. So when you're sort of contextualizing this film, right, you can't just sort of place this within the history of serial killer films, right? Firstly, the title, right? <clears throat> Monster. So there was a film called, you know, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer um, about 20 years ago. It is a good film. But it's about a man and he's a serial killer and obviously the title serial killer goes quite nicely, right? But in the media around Island Warnos, she was rarely spoken of as a serial killer. She was mostly spoken of as a monster because how could a female do what males seem to do all the time and they seem to do so naturally, which is go around and kill people? And the film is responding against that. So the film is not calling itself monster to say she is a monster. The film is calling itself monster to look at the sense of hypocrisy that goes around gendered media and the way that we genderify women as opposed to men. And certainly when it becomes down to violent women, the way that we depict them, uh, women so differently to men, certainly violent women as opposed to men. Right? So it's playing around with all of those issues um, within its adaptation. So again, because it's not one source that the adaptation is coming from, but many, it's actually responding to a lot of these sources. Right? And if there's one source that it, it actually is in agreement with and is heavily influenced the, the tone of the film and the theme of the film and the, the, sort of the angle of the film, it is that Nick Broomfield documentary that I kept mentioning. So the film is certainly a, a deconstruction, and that's a text that directly asks questions about its own adaptation process. Now, unlike a film like, say, American Splendor, where you've got the, the character of Harvey Pika, and then he stops and he just sort of turns and he starts talking to the camera, you know, and, and the, the film is doing this sort of smart assy kind of, hey, 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 we're just a film, we're just a film, right? It's not doing that. What it's doing is it's taking, you know, what one um, media report said, a beautiful actress who came to embody a hideous murderer, right? It's taking one of the most glamorous actress act or female actors in the world, Charlie Theron, and it's, it's turning her into someone who looks remarkably like um, the real-life serial killer. Now, the whole film is so based on Charlie's Theron's performance, her impersonation, um, not only in vocally her impersonation, but visually her impersonation. The real question of the film is, did the performance overshadow broader social issues of the narrative and also of the adaptation? And can a performance be so dominant that it actually overshadows the broader things that are actually going on in, uh, in in an adaptation, okay? So was the film diminished because it was teetered to Theron's corporeal and emotional transformation? So think about that. When you're watching the film, if, if the film is actually about there are these social problems of violence against women and the depiction of violent women, Right? And that's what the film was really interested in wanting to get across. And let's just go along with the, the director, and that's what the film, you know, that was the intention of the film. If that's the intention of the film, then does that come across? Or are you just sitting there for the whole time, just mesmerized by this great performance? And does the whole film become about a performance? And does the whole adaptation become about a performance? And is that a problem or is that actually a really good thing about the film that it actually becomes about, you know, this central actor, um, you know, showing how good she is at work. Now, the problem with the deconstruction is also the, the, the reviews that came out um, on the film. And th this is what Elle magazine said. 
if you're looking at Charlize Theron, you're too late. She's no longer here, not anymore. She's gained a good 30 pounds and has let her expensively high-tailed hair oxicide into a rusty brownish overgrown shag. The former camera magnate now knows what it's like to be unrecognisable in the most painful sense of the word. When people see her coming, they don't look twice, they look away. Now, you know, there are huge, huge problems with that statement from Elle magazine. I mean, firstly, it's it's essentially saying that, you know, if you look ordinary, you know, you get this really negative response to people on the street. And this is how, you know, the average person is treated on the, on the street, which, you know, is obviously, um, you know, the, the, the problems of that is just completely bonkers, right, to think that. And to think that Charlie Theron had to actually make herself ordinary to the point of ugly, which is what Elle magazine is, um, you know, is sort of implying here, to in order to understand how normal people are perceived on the street and therefore she can act how a normal person would be perceived is actually disrespectful to her as a professional actor and it's also a bit insane to think that, you know, Charlie's Theron has never been treated as an ordinary person at some point in her life. Of course, you know, Elle magazine is a very glamorous magazine. And so the idea of this glamorous person be, be, becoming this sort of um, uh, ugly person, if, if that's, you know, if you want to go with Elle's um, perception, is, is kind of interesting in the way that they're perceiving it. But Men's Health um, takes the cake for the most inappropriate um, advertising of the film, which says, is, Add a thrill to date night with Monster. The story of the serial killer Eileen Warnos with Oscar-winning Charlie's Theron as Eileen. Can I just read you the first bit again? Add a thrill to date night with Monster. This is a film which is about a woman, right, who suffered sexual abuse from people, right, who should have been looking after her and protecting her, right, a woman who couldn't get a decent job, so she was forced to go and work the streets as a prostitute, a woman who responded in self-defense and ended up killing people, right? That's what the film is about. It's about this culture, right, where men treat women in a particular way, right, and men feel like they can depict women in a particular way. And it's about this woman responding against that in a violent way. And what do Men's Health say? Add a thrill to date night. Like, what's what's that actually about? What the fuck is that actually about? Add a thrill to date night. You know, like, go and get your jollies watching, um, you know, this this person um, and the, the horrific life that she had to live. Um, it's just, it's crazy, like, some of the shit that some of these uh, media outlets come up with um, in promoting a film. But I think what both of these reviews do, which is really interesting, is they're actually saying, that you see, they're not being convinced by what the film is meant to be about, which is the social issues and us all taking a long look at ourselves in the mirror as a society and as a community and doing better, right? It's actually about Charlie Theron's um, performance. And I think it's kind of interesting in those, you know, in the based on film, where does the ba- is the based on film really just about a performance and impersonation? Or is it about something much stronger and much, something much wider? Um, it's interesting that although Charlie uh, wins for um, the Academy Award for Best Female Actor, uh, the film isn't nominated for anything else, and that's that that tells you a lot about the way that also the Academy was perceiving this film. Now, the film is very much a revision. Revision seeks to alter the meaning and spirit of the source. So, Monster, it invites audiences to sympathise with a woman 
for whom conventional wisdom says they should feel no sympathy. Right? So that's what the film is saying. You should feel no sympathy for, not the film, sorry, but, you know, what the pop popular media was saying. That you should feel no sympathy for this woman. You know, she's a horrendous serial killer, right? And what the, what the film's doing, it's, it invites audiences to sympathise with her. The casting of Charlie's Theron is going to do that, right? Just the fact that you've got this hugely popular female actor, right, playing her, right, suddenly you're going to this, this character with, you know, I like this person because I like the actor, right? So that, that's where you, you went to where you're starting. You're starting with that whole idea. So think about that. Um, think about the ways that the film is trying to manipulate you to uh, sympathize with her and, um, you know, certainly kind of continuing um, uh, the Broomfield um, stuff, which, which actually can be seen um, on YouTube, that film. Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer. Now, the criminal justice system and mainstream media are quick to defeminize violent women by emphasizing their sexual deviancy when possible or highlighting their violation of other gender norms. Right? So the typical te television coverage of the case featured interviews with the wives of the men Warner's killed. Um portraying her victims as family men, right? Not as men who are actually leaving those wives and going and soliciting prostitutes on the side of the road, right? And what the film is doing is it's, firstly, it's saying to be in a queer relationship, right, is actually, there's nothing you know, atypical about that, you know, in many regards, it's actually, it's a, it's a fine, normal, healthy thing for anyone to do, right? And that's different to the mainstream media. The mainstream media were saying, well, she was this crazy, you know, vengeful lesbian who just wanted to go out and kill men, right? And the film's not depicting her like that. The film is depicting her like someone who literally just wants to be loved and she's in this relationship and it's a good, healthy relationship for her. All right, it's the most healthy relationship she's ever been in. And the fact that it's a lesbian relationship, I think, doesn't mean as much for the film um, as, say, the mainstream media were making out. Right? Her sexual orientation doesn't mean as much. And Patty Jenkins normalizes that. And I think that helps in sympathizing her and not actually looking at, um, you know, uh, you know, sexuality as as a as a problem and something that you can actually use as almost a weapon against someone or use as evidence to prove something against someone. Right? Now, some writers have criticised um, Jenkins, the director, for distorting actual events in ways that framed Warnos in an overly sympathetic light. So, think about that. Um, also, when you're watching it, the way that the film is kind of it's sort of reshaping particular things about Warnos. Are uh, certainly the self-defense argument. A lot of people think that she never was responding in self-defense. She was always just um, uh, she she was always just out to kill. She wanted to kill men. She was picking up these men to kill them. It was never in self-defense. So the film is making that argument, and again, it's re, re, you know, it's a revision on the way that the Warnos narrative has been um, discussed, and you know what these films are doing. You know, a film like I Shot Andy Warhol, or a film like Monster, is it's taking the, that popular image and distorting that, um, which is why you know the based on is often a a, a revision of um, you know popular beliefs and thinking. So just a final thought, um, I mean, some of you may think, well, Monster's not an adaptation, but my question back to you would be, well, if it's not an adaptation, then what is it, right? Like, what do we do, what do we read the film as, right? So when you're watching it, like, it is... It is a perfect example of a deconstruction adaptation in a way because when you're watching it, you're constantly being told 
about certain moments that really happened, you know, dates and things, you know, to, to emphasize that. Um, you're constantly reminded of the actor playing the person, right, which actually happened. There's, um, you know, there's YouTube now where you can actually go and look at the real Eileen Warnos and, you know, make that comparison. Um, so if, if it's not adaptation, then the film is actually encouraging us to read the film in a way that we would as an adaptation. Like if you think of a fictional adaptation like Science of the Lambs, right, you go and watch the film and you think, wow, I wonder, I wonder how much that's based on the book. So, you know, you go and you do your little homework. You, 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 you read the book. You know, you look at other sources. You may look at an interview with the author and look at, you know, his inspiration and things like that, right? So the film is playing with the same set of rules as a piece of fiction. It's just that it's based on fact, right? How do we assess the multi-sourced adaptation? Right? The multi-sourced adaptation is complicated because it's not easy. It's not saying, like Sons of the Lambs, here's the novel, here's the film, do your comparison, see what's the same, what's different, and then base it on that. Right? And it seems to be with that idea is you know, the more that's changed, the worse the, the film actually is. Right? So the multi-sourced adaptation is coming from all different places, right? So it's it, it's, it's hard for the adapter to construct that, but it's also challenging for the viewer to think of that because it's requiring the viewer to go and do some work. You know, It's requiring the viewer to actually go and look at and think about the real cases that this was inspired on and inspired by. Okay, so I think that's really important when it comes to thinking about um, you know adaptation and monster and the way that monster does actually play within those those same rules. And just finally, what responsibility does the adapter have when the adaptation is based on a true story? I'm thinking ethics here. What ethical obligation did Patty Jenkins have? Did she behave in an ethical manner to not give the victims um, any sympathy? And the families any sympathy? The, the families were furious with this film, um, which again is something worth I think picking up because I mean often the the response to um, say an author being adapted is, is very influential. You know, a lot of people go into a film like say The Birds, Hitchcock's The Birds, knowing that Daphne du Maurier hated the adaptation, thinking well it can't be very good because the author didn't think it was very good, right? So. Does the fact that the the victims' families hate the film actually influence how we read the how we read this this um this movie, right? How important is the literary text? What is the literary text here? The literary text is really um, Broomfield's uh, adaptation and also the media news that was actually coming out at the time, right? How important are the historical figures in this film, right? What happens when you're actually putting fictional figures in a historical story? How does that confuse and convolute the whole problem? And just finally, how is fidelity measured in a film like this? How do we actually measure if this film is faithful? Is the film faithful? Who's it faithful to? How is it faithful? All right, I'll leave it there. Um, I think you'll enjoy Monster. It's um, it, it's quite uh, it's quite a remarkable uh, movie. Um, tremendous performance, and um, there's just so much to talk about in regard to the depiction of this film, the performance of the film, and also adaptation more widely. Um, the purpose of this um, film is really to complicate the maybe the the simplistic way that we often think about adaptation and actually think about well, you know. A film like this absolutely is adaptation in the way that's asking us to read the film in a particular way. All right, I'll leave it there. Look forward to talking about it with you soon. Um, catch you then.